Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. perpetual fear and love of thy holy name. For thou never failest to help and govern those whom thou hast set upon the sure foundation of thy loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? 
and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of the Lord. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. As we work together with Christ, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet as true as unknown and yet as well known as dying and see we are alive as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory be to you, Lord. When evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Please be seated. If you haven't been paying close attention, you may have missed that we have a new national holiday on June 19th. President Biden signed into law on Thursday an observance of Juneteenth National Independence Day. The word Juneteenth is a combination of the words June and 19th. It is also known as Jubilee Day, Black Independence Day, and Emancipation Day. It is a celebration of the June 19th 1865 announcement of the General Order No. 3 by Union Army General Gordon Granger proclaiming freedom for enslaved people in Texas. For me, Juneteenth is a relatively new phrase and celebration. If I'm honest, a little over a year ago I heard it for the very first time during a diocesan staff meeting and I had no idea what they were talking about. So I quickly Googled it to learn of its meaning and origin. My ignorance of this day, at least from my perspective, only adds to my awareness of my white privilege, of the limited exposure that I have to people of color, and beyond that, quite honestly, to people of other ethnicities as well. Juneteenth is an important day because it marks the end of slavery in the most remote state of the then Union, which was Texas. Even though slavery was officially outlawed almost two and a half years before that, via Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, it wasn't until the Union troops reached Texas, announced the proclamation, and began enforcing it 
that the slaves were finally freed. For this reason, it is a day celebrated by people of color all over the United States, and it is now a national holiday. Now, it has taken me a long time to realize in my own life how deeply ingrained my own racism is. I don't share this with you lightly from a perspective of how far I've come, nor with any instructions on exactly what you should do in your own life to become more aware of the large and small ways racism permeates thoughts, words, and actions. To be truthful, I tremble in my sandals more than a little in this moment, even preaching on the topic both from a fear of how you might react and also from my own fear of expressing myself wrongly or in a damaging way. As Dr. Lynn Westfield, director of the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning, shared with my pastoral leadership program in May, silence about racism is pastoral malpractice. That phrase truly hit home for me. My fear of pastoral malpractice is greater than my fear of speaking out about racism. And so I share with you a few of my own personal experiences in the hope that my honesty and vulnerability will be well received and put to good use. I grew up in a home in rural Michigan, where I was completely surrounded by white people. The N-word was used frequently and without shame. While I viewed people of color on television, I didn't actually interact with a single black person until my freshman year of high school when our first and only black student arrived. I remember how he stuck out in the sea of white faces in our hallways. I remember being intrigued and wondering if all the things I'd heard about black men were true in this young man. I shared a gym class with him and got to know him reasonably well. I admit to feeling rather proud of having a black friend. I remember saying to myself with pride that I no longer saw his color, only his personality. I have since learned that the phrase, I don't see color, can be one of the most racist phrases we can use. Not seeing color means one expects everyone to think, behave, and have the same privileges as they do. That is simply untrue, always. There were and remain so many lessons for me to learn about racism even today, I would say my very white world is still surrounded by very white people, but I am trying and I am becoming more aware. As a segue, our gospel passage this morning is that interesting story of Jesus calming the storm while he and the disciples are afloat on the Sea of Galilee. The Galilean Sea is prone to sudden violent storms given its proximity to the surrounding hills and its position below sea level. It's second only to the Dead Sea in terms of its lowest elevation. Even the disciples, who were seasoned fishermen themselves, were terrified of this particular storm. Keeping in mind that we're still early in Mark's gospel, the disciples are only beginning to know what they dare to believe about Jesus. Until now, Jesus has mostly been preaching and teaching, talking about the sowing of seeds and the promise of a harvest, healing people and exercising demons. The disciples don't know much about Jesus at this point. However, they do know that the boat is being battered by the storm. He is sleeping peacefully, and he seems not to care at all about their sure demise. The scripture reads, 
the boat was already being swamped, which can only mean it was quickly filling with water and their imminent drowning was at hand. Incredulous that Jesus might sleep through this, they wake him and ask him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It seems like a rather reasonable question to me, if I'm honest. Jesus' response, however, is neither reasonable nor expected. He stands, he rebukes the wind, he says to the sea, Peace, be still. And there is suddenly, from violent crashing winds, now dead, complete calm. It was immediate, absolute, and one must think just as equally terrifying to those disciples. They say, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. They are only beginning to see who this Jesus is, and I might venture to add that we also are only beginning to see who this Jesus is in our own lives. We might not be in a rapidly sinking boat, but there is positively no doubt our world is in a storm nearly as terrifying as that storm was to the disciples. We can't look to the left or right, forward or back, without seeing some sort of storm that threatens one population of our world or another. Hope, combined with faith in a God that has ultimate control over all, is the only thing that keeps us moving forward, that keeps our boat afloat. To pull together all the examples in, this, in my sermon this morning, I must draw your attention to one specific portion of the gospel reading this morning. It says, other boats were with him. Did you even notice that when I read it? We may have missed this short, short sentence completely. Certainly it's so easy to get wrapped up in the drama of the forces of nature being obedient to Jesus that we miss the fact there were other boats on that sea at the same time. These boats didn't have a sleeping Jesus. They didn't hear him give the command to be still they may or may not have even had any hope. Their boats may have been larger or smaller, in better or in worse condition. We have no idea. The only thing we do know is that there were indeed other boats. David Jacobson, in his commentary on this passage from workingpreacher.com, draws a corollary between the gospel passage and the situation in our society today when he says, we are all in the same storm. We are not necessarily in the same boat. This was revelatory to me. We are indeed in the same storm, this storm of 2021, with all of its oddities associated with it, but we are certainly not all in the same boat. Regardless of our individual perspectives on racism, or I might say any other hot topic I could have selected for my sermon this morning, we're not in the same boat as other people around us. As I shared in the news from the Red Doors a few weeks ago, I, as a white middle class woman, have little fear of being pulled over for a traffic violation. As a nation, we have witnessed several times in the last year alone when this has not been true for a black person, particularly a black man. As one person among many, I can do really very little to fix the issue. I know that. I can, however, bring more awareness to it by speaking about my own realizations and asking each of you to consider more deeply how you might strive to become more 
and more anti-racist. It's not easy work for any of us, and yet the important work rarely is easy. As my own mental health therapist shared with me recently during one of our telehealth sessions, she said, the work you are doing now, Michelle, to improve the relationships in your life and to be true to yourself as a person is hard work. It will be much harder later if you don't do the work now. I know that she's right. And if we're all honest, we probably all could agree with her. God created no being that he does not love unconditionally, although we human beings have had the most difficult time modeling that behavior. We are too often the disciples in that boat, worrying about ourselves and wondering what Jesus is up to instead of running to him for intervention immediately. So if you're a little bit like me and new to the celebration of Juneteenth, which of course was yesterday, maybe you'll do a little research of your own and celebrate it belatedly. If you're a bit like me and not totally aware of the many ways our daily actions, privileges, and thoughts are influenced by our innate racism, maybe you'll take some steps to become more aware. If you're a bit like me, maybe you'll dare to talk about it just a little bit at hopefully the right time and learn from the mistakes that we all make along the way. We, all of God's creation, are in the same storm, and yet we are definitely not all in the same boat. May we each find the resources we need in the boats we have. And may we have patience, tolerance, unconditional love, and acceptance for the many, many people in the other boats also on this stormy sea. We don't know their condition, and yet we can be assured of God's unconditional love for them. I'd like to end with a Juneteenth prayer, which is courtesy of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, copyrighted in 2019. Let us, with awareness and hopefulness in our heart, pray. Holy and righteous God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us, like those of generations before us, resist the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son,
who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy, Hear our prayer. give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Doug, our bishop, and Michelle, our priest, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. We beseech thee also to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, and Tom, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. We most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Sally, Tom, Linda, Winnie, Gordon, Elsie, Gloria, Gary, Steve, Charlie, Rebecca, Lauren, Helen, Barb, Doris, and Marianne, and all immigrants and refugees, and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, sickness, need, or any other adversity. Lord, in thy mercy, Hear our we command to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with thy heavenly grace and grant them a sense of thy abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Creator, in the midst of this pandemic, we implore thee to guard and protect all of our medical professionals and frontline workers, to safeguard each of us from the virus, and to grant us patience and mental health as we continue to make good decisions to contain this disease. We pray for the disbursement and the efficacy of the vaccinations, Lord. We beseech thee to bring to full recovery all those suffering from COVID and its aftermath. And we remember all those that have succumbed to the pandemic who now rest in thy loving embrace. Lord, in thy mercy. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, St. Paul, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Father, God, Lord Jesus. 
for birthdays and anniversaries. I have listed that Doris, Zazie, and Linda Baker both have birthdays this upcoming week. Is there anybody else who has an upcoming birthday that's not on my list? Okay, let us pray for Doris and Linda. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Doris and Linda, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And they have no anniversaries listed for this week. Is that true? Okay, that appears to be true. I do have one question for Winnie Eirig. Winnie, do I hear you're taking a travel trip here pretty soon? Yes, Winnie is leaving for the vineyard this week, so I'd like to offer a prayer for her safe travels and a joyous time um, on, the, on the island. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Winnie and for her ability to return to Martha's Vineyard with her family this year. Lord, we pray for your traveling mercies that she may arrive there safely, have the most joyous summer with her family and her friends, and return to us safely as well in the early fall. Lord, be with Winnie and those who travel with her and care for her while she's there. And we'll miss her. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share the peace. It's so delightful to see all these smiling faces this morning. Please be seated. I do have a few announcements. A few, I said, not a couple, a few. Uh, first of all, if this is your first time being with us since the beginning of the pandemic, just wanted to let you know that we bring communion, I bring communion to you in the pews um, so that we don't have to have as much um, mingling in the aisles. And we receive communion in the form of the bread or the body of Christ alone, which we all know is, is still a perfect communion. So if you'd like to receive communion, simply put your hand out like this, and I'll place a wafer in your hand. If you would prefer a blessing only, just cross your arms over your chest, and I'll know that you prefer to receive a blessing alone. Um, second of all, we have new directories. Thank you to Michael Konezny. Um, he was busily printing them here yesterday. They are um, at the check-in spot at Harrison Street. If you picked one up on the way in, wonderful. If you didn't, please pick one up on the way out. We ask that you just take one per household to start out to make sure that we have enough. And then if we want more, we can print more or we can make more available. Secondly, I don't know if you ordered a shirt, but again, thanks to Mike Konezny, we're very excited to have the new version of the St. Paul's Episcopal shirt. Um, Mike picked these up on Friday, so if you ordered one, please meet him um, near the library and he will give you your shirt. If you didn't order one, I did order a few extra, and I do still have them available for sale, but you have to wear a medium, large, extra large, or 2X. So I tried to get a variety, but not many in each variety. So thank you, Mike. Not only did he get the shirts done, but as you may know, he's also a graphic designer. So he designed the emblem as well, which is lovely. Also, just a reminder that our chair and church events continue strong. We had 10 people um, at Fox Park on Wednesday night for the City Band concert. And we will be there again this coming Wednesday night if you would like to join us. Tuesday night, don't forget, if you're on vestry, we have a 5.30 to 9 p.m., yes, you heard that right, meeting, where we will be doing our mutual ministry review. So if you're on vestry, please don't forget to show up on Tuesday night. And last, but definitely not least, on Mother's Day, I wasn't sure how to commemorate the day. 
this is my first time in, in, in this church as your priest, and I didn't really have a prayer. I said Happy Mother's Day and had some conversations about um, how Mother's Day, as well as Father's Day, can be happy or sad for different people. And since then, I have encountered a prayer that I think works very nicely for other mothers or fathers, with thanks to Pastor Pamela Thede from the Calumet Episcopal Ministry Partnership. I offer a prayer and blessing for Mother's Day, acknowledging that I didn't pray and bless. I, I should say, I offer one today for Father's Day, acknowledging I didn't offer one for Mother's Day. It's not because I like fathers better. It's because I'm growing and evolving as a priest. So at this time, I would like to offer a Father's Day prayer and blessing. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the many gifts you have given us, the gift of life, the gift of those who love us, and today especially we thank you for the gift of our fathers. We ask your blessing upon our fathers who gave us rules to live by, standards to uphold, joys to cherish, faith to strengthen us, hopes worth dreaming of, and who blessed our lives with their unselfish and unconditional love. We ask your blessing upon adoptive fathers, that they may also know their special role of father, a revelation of God's love for their children. We ask your blessing upon fathers who have lost children, that they may have your continuing strength and courage. We ask your blessing upon those who want to be fathers or to have another child, that they may practice patience and feel your love as they wait with hope. We remember our fathers who have died, and for the unique way they revealed for us love. We ask that you keep them in your care until the time comes for us to join them in your kingdom. We even pray for those men who were to be our fathers, but because of their human frailties, abandoned, neglected, or even misused us. May they be forgiven of their sins, and may we find healing in the true love of the one perfect Father, God the Father. And we ask your blessing upon all fathers. Bless them, protect them, guide them, and keep them in your care. Give them the strength to live the faithful and loving lives you call them to live. All this we ask in the name of our one true Heavenly Father. Amen. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who may thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of all our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we, and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion, may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. My home and welcome in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all to thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. 
Let us pray. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Jesus. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. And since some of us cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech thee to come spiritually into our hearts and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus. 